Hi, and welcome to Archery Ops Podcast, brought to you by Gold Tip Arrows and Bee Stinger Stabilizers. On each episode, we talk to top experts in archery and bow hunting about what it takes to shoot better and hunt better, target after target, hunt after hunt, shot after shot. I'm your host, Tim Gillingham. Let's roll. I want to kind of welcome you to the new Archery Ops Podcast by Gold Tip. It's a new podcast that we started. We just hope to bring, you know, knowledge and advice to the uh outdoor and shooting community, bring on some exciting guests. And then I want to bring on some guests that are really unique that a lot of people probably don't know that I know personally and, and, you know, take requests from other people. But I've, I've got some really interesting guys that I think the, the industry can benefit from that don't necessarily subscribe to social media and things like that. And, you know, that you're kind of a powerhouse in the outdoor industry in, you know, in, in regards to that. So it's one of the reasons I want to bring you on too, just to kind of, you know, people probably, you know, including myself kind of, you know, how, do, how did Chris B build his brand, you know? And so we got, we got a couple questions, you know, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, some questions on, you know, different topics and we can kind of, we try to stay along those lines and, and stick to an hour, but uh, we're, yeah. uh, you know, we can go a little bit, a little bit off subject if, if we like. So, you know, perfect. You know, for our viewership, you know, I met you kind of through tournament archery, and mm-hmm. um, then all of a sudden you're this hot shot. You know, yeah, no, still sensei. doing this, still doing the same stuff. We just end up filming everything that we do. Yeah, it's pretty interesting to watch. You know, I've I've got some aspirations to do, and not necessarily that I have these great aspirations to do it. I just feel like it's irresponsible of me not to leave what I've learned to the archery world. And yeah. sometimes I like to crawl under a rock and not come out from underneath it, but that's just not, I guess, what I bargained for. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, sometimes I wish I could do that too. Sometimes I wish I could delete social media and everything altogether and just take a break for a while. <laughs> yeah. But. Yeah. It's just, I come home yesterday and I feel like I've been on the road since for seven months. I just, it's yeah. Been, Cause I, I drew an elk tag in Utah. So we got straight off of the, uh, U.S. Target Nationals, and two days later, into the into the mountains or three, and it was just crazy. I saw that. Yeah, did you end up killing one or no? I didn't, man. I mean, I didn't. Uh, Isaac uh, come down from BC and filmed it for me, and he just nice. wanted to come down and hang out. I'm glad he did because it was it was good hanging out with the kid. He was he's he's only eighteen, nineteen. He pushed me pretty hard, so you know, and there, that kid's just man, he can go up and down them hills like nothing. Probably like yeah. I, when I was his age, you know, but right. Yeah. Especially you, you with those long legs, I'm sure when you were good, good cardio and everything, you could be yeah. all over the place. By, by the, yeah. By the end of the hunt, man, we were, we were peeling off into stuff that we wouldn't even have considered day three, you know, <laughs> um, you were desperate at that point. Well, that unit's just brutal, you know, and where the elk, a lot of the elk were, you know, it was just 1500 vertical down a thousand vertical up and up and down and back. Yeah. And it's just, oof, gotta wear a you lot. down. Yeah, waters, all the waters in the bottom, you know, it just, you know, we spike camped out, you know, we had a great hunt. It was just one of those hunts that I think one of the few hunts that I've been on, I didn't get anything, but I felt satisfied. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure to perform, you know, in the industry, you know, if you're a sponsored shooter or such and such, and I'm sure you feel the same thing, but uh, let's kind of delve into our first topic. You know, you've been on some. I've noticed some pretty good hunts in the last couple of years. You know, you did a, what, Alaska moose. Is that right? Yeah. Moose hunt last year. Um, then went on a couple more this year. We did, uh, caribou Caribou. and then mountain goat. Yeah. This year. Where'd you go? Mountain goat. Uh, Northern BC. Oh, so you went up where the big boys are. Did you get a good one? Yeah, I did. Um, it was 47. 47. That's cool. Yeah. So it was good. It was a, I, it's, it's a funny story. We ended up shooting it on our first actual day of hunting, um, Hmm. which we had, we had 12 days allotted. So it's like, we shot them right away, but it was literally, we shot one as fast as we possibly could. Like we hiked in, we got dropped off, um, by a float plane. And then, uh, we hiked like five and a half miles in spike camped. And then where we wanted to go was like another two miles. Um, and next morning, we hiked up that way, like pretty much right at, you know, seven o'clock in the morning or whatever, 
Got there at like 11. It was our first glassing knob. We sat down and it was like, boom, there's two goats, you know, maybe 1,500 yards, 2,000 yards uh, down and up. They were bedded in this like rock face. Um, and one was the one I shot. And then there was another Billy that was well over 50 inches. Um, so like a really, really nice, really old one. And uh, long story short, we got in position on them. They kind of moved and we got in close and uh, my guide was in front of me and then it was me and then camera. So it was like the three, three musketeers just going in slow and we closed, we took boots off at about a hundred yards. Um, they were bedded right up over this little cliff. Um, and we got in like, you know, where it's like, okay, they're like going to be right here sort of thing. And sure enough, the guide's like, right here, right here, 30. And that's all he said. And one Billy stood up out of his bed. And uh, I didn't even have an arrow knock because we didn't even see him or anything yet. So I knocked an arrow quick and just drew back and I shot. And right when I shot, there was uh, the rock edge was like 15 yards close. And right there at 15 yards, the big 50 plus inch Billy stood up um, right there. And that was the one we were going in after. I mean, they were both great. The one that ended up shooting. Yeah, was, it's was hard great. to tell. I mean, that's, that's, there's not a massive amount of difference between a 47 and a 50 inch goat. No, there wasn't. Uh, the, the one, I, the one was probably closer to like 53 to 55. The guide was saying, I mean, he was, he, he was a world-class goat. Yeah. Yeah. That's a monster. Well, I think the world record with the bow is 57 or 58. And I mean, he, the guide was like, he, he used to guide, um, down in Southern BC, um, at, uh, where I forget the place he used to guide, but 26 years of, uh, bow hunting goat experience is what he's had, like guiding bow hunting goats. So he's killed, I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens of goats. And he was like, that was the, that was one of or the biggest goat he's gotten within shooting distance. So that was kind of disappointing. But I was like, hey, man, I'm, like you said, it's like there's not much telling between the two goats. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm I super guess, pumped with it. He's Pope and Young. Like, I'm yeah, all that's, there. yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's a taxing hunt. I, I drew my tag in Utah here about three or four years. I've killed three of them with a bow. And nice. But, what killed me was that freaking elevation, man. We were camped oh, at 11.5, yeah. 11, and then we were up on the mountain. Me and Sean stayed on the mountain at 13 with no yeah. gear. One night. That was just – I don't know if you saw that video they did for that film festival. Sean and I roughed it one night. No, I didn't. Yeah, we roughed it one night on the mountain. I had two trash bags, a Tyvek suit, <laughs> and a space blanket. No way. <laughs> and for our viewership, if you ever put a space blanket in your backpack and you actually have to use it, it better be the sleeping bag kind. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'd never even thought other, about that because there is the blanket and the sleeping bag one. Yeah, the blanket kind is flat worthless. So we were in 50 mile an hour winds all night. It was freaking brutal. But, Yikes. That's hilarious. But, it, but I mean... To go to your point of like it just being brutal, it definitely was the most challenging. I mean, I haven't done a lot of extreme, extreme hunts like that, but so far it's it was definitely one of the most brutal hunts. I mean, you know, thousand feet up, thousand feet down. Yeah. Um it I goes, mean it was yeah. at times we were rock climbing, you know, like legit mm -hmm. rock climbing. It was it was quite scary at times but i have the closest i've come to dying hunting it's mount, mountain goat hunting. <laughs> i mean they just that's that's their one uh competitive advantage of living is they can just get in these crazy places away from grizzlies and wolves and everything that's trying to kill them yeah we went in on this registration hunt up in hope alaska and okay it was bluebird right we get up there when you take pitch camp take off i went with my buddy and i don't know we we crested this ridge right before we crest this ridge we hear this rifle shot I'm like what the hell mm. we crest the ridge and clear in the very bottom there's a guy shooting at this big billy that's just like 150 yards from us oh wow and i mean we're talking 35 degree uphill shot All right most guy, and he was probably seven eight hundred yards you know and uh he didn't hit him, and I just took off after that, Billy. My buddy looked at me like, you're nuts. 
And, but anyway, I ended up getting on one and killing one. Watched it fall all the way to the bottom. I mean, 1,500 feet. I don't know if there's anything left of it by the time it got there. It just, oh, that, really? It was bad. And it snowed a foot on us that night. Oh. You know, and, and in terms of the, the topic of logistics for, you know, adventure hunts, I mean, you got to be prepared, man. I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, when you're up there at those kind of elevations, the weather can change like that. And if you're yeah. not ready for it, I mean, we were letting ourselves down through the alders on about a 35, 40 degree slope. And I slipped and tobogganed off and I went off. Really? And, yeah. I probably, I probably fell 10 feet straight down on my back on a rock and my pack broke my fall. It literally broke every single pin in my pack. It was like an old Cabela Schrader frame. Oh, but wow. I'm gonna save my bacon. But yeah. When you nah. start, you know, you start thinking the good Lord's got a little bit different plan for you. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was definitely scary at times. It's yeah. yeah. You gotta be, you gotta be in good shape and you gotta be, have good, good gear all the way around. I yeah, mean, start you, to finish. You know, you, you hear the conversation of people talking about, you know, the price of Sitka and the price of Kuyu gear and stuff like that. And I mean, I did some crazy hunts back in the day cause we didn't know any better. You know, mm -hmm. had, you know, wool or whatever, the old police and stuff like that. And we just layered in yeah. and stuff. There is really something to be said about sick of gear and some of that stuff. When you get up into that Alaska, Yukon hunting, late season up here on the Wasatch front, things like that, where, you know, you really start to see the benefit of, of quality gear. I mean, I've had some of the sick of stuff I've had for shoot 10 years i think so it's very very durable yeah. stuff too so how old are you now chris 26 20 oh man you're just a pup yeah <laughs> good lord you, you can't yeah. really you had time to experience that Come no <laughs> that's why that's why you know i mean it's it's still uh super humbling and i don't like to talk uh like i know everything in the entire world because i definitely don't so it's yeah. been cool to cool to cool to do a little bit you know and, and learn a little bit <laughs> I get this question a lot. How important are my stabilizers? Well, stabilizer is probably one of the most important things on my bow. Its job is to control the motion before, during, and after the shot. That helps us hold steady. It helps hold the bow still while the bow is loading and unloading from full draw to static. And it also controls the bow against our mistakes, so it makes it more forgiving. With B-Stinger, you get a lightweight, high modulus bar with vibration dampening built into the bar. This is very critical in terms of getting the most out of your stabilization system. If you want to learn more, check out bstinger.com. Well, I, I look at all these younger guys going out and doing stuff like this. I got a guy I want to bring on this podcast that I just follow him on Instagram. And this guy kills so much stuff and he does every bit of it with a recurve. And, and I mean, oh, that's cool all over Alaska, everything, just one of them diehard recurve guys. And it's just interesting to bring a guy like that in and just say, why do you do what you do? You know, obviously, right. You know, you got to have a lot of time, you know, and I guess, yeah. you know, doing what you've done for yourself, you know, has created a lot of the time to take that time pressure off you. You know, I'm, I'm sure you're like Levi, you got to bang, 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 bang. You still shoot a lot of tournaments or. Uh, I mean, as, as everything else is taking off, I only really do the big ones. You yeah. know, I'll do an ASA or two a year. I'll do Vegas. I'll do, you know, maybe a couple other random ones just to stay in it. Cause I do enjoy it. I mean, I love it. I've been doing it for so long. Um, mm -hmm. but it's so time consuming, like, you know, and, and, it, you know, just like yourself, if you, halfway did something you would be not happy with it so i get really right. frustrated i get really frustrated because i don't have the time to practice i don't do anything and then it's like i show up and i just kind of shoot okay you know and yeah, it's I, like I, I think about you know levi how he comes off the year now i shoot probably twice as many tournaments as he does but you yeah. know and, and then he goes straight into hunting on film i don't know that i would like that personally i don't know that <laughs> i like hunting but I don't know if I like it that much. Yeah. He, oh. he does a lot, man. And I think the same thing. It's like, geez, it's high level competition, obviously. And then like straight into, I mean, I think he shoots, 
you know, like 12, 12 bucks or like, you know, antler things a year, give or take. It's just yeah. on film. I mean, that's just, it's yeah. nuts. It's so nuts you, what he you does. find, you, do you find planning for a trip with camera guy and everything much more difficult? It's, it's something I think that people have to really be aware of when you, when you go to Alaska or something it's logistically, it can be tough. I mean, like I got up caribou hunt last year and I couldn't find my Kuyu bomber hat and I couldn't find my puffy jacket. I think mm. they got stolen in the airport, but those are two oh. key, key essential pieces of gear. So, you know, things like that, you know, I, I, I look at it like, well, I want to make sure I have at least two beanie style hats. I want to mm. make sure I've got, you know, maybe a puffy vest and a puffy jacket, but I had a puffy vest. Thank God. It kind of saved my bacon, but really, uh, yeah, stuff just kind of disappeared somewhere along the way. Yeah, it's uh, man, planning for planning for a trip like that, especially it's it's tough. And if you're planning it by yourself, if it's like a DIY, like let's say you drew drew a goat right. tag or drew drew something, it's it's a little bit different than like going with an outfitter because at least when you when you go with an outfitter, you can talk with them. Hopefully, you can get the number to the guide you're going with, and you can kind of talk to them. Um, but one big one big takeaway that I got from my guide, who's been doing it forever i i i'm just like a sponge just asking him pepper and questions he probably got annoyed with me but uh you know he's he's the best in the business when it comes to like archery goat hunting so i was just like what where do you where do you see people messing up the most and what he said is it kind of threw me off he's like people bring too many pants he's like people come up here with two pairs of pants and he's like it's just not necessary it's like you have you want one light pair of pants because it's a very, at least for the like August, September go hunts, you want one light pair of pants um, that you're hiking in constantly or whatever. And he's like, you don't need a backup because you have puffy pants, uh, like the three quarter puffy pants. Cause if weather gets cold and you need those, then you have rain pants. He's like, those are your three pants, but people will bring like you know, some timberline pants and then some mountain pants and then some ascent pants. Cause they're like, well, maybe right. I'll get a hole in one or whatever. He's like, no, he's like yeah, one you... pair of, one pair of hiking pants. And if for some reason you rip them off, he's like, you have your rain pants or you have your puffy. Like he's like, yeah, pants. that's one thing I'd, I'd caution people about is rain gear, man. Oh, I yeah, lived that in Alaska yeah. for eight years and rain gear is Man, even some of the high end stuff, you seem to always be wet when you're in the rain. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, you know, I didn't wear it once in uh, Alaska or a BC while I was there. I was very fortunate. We got good weather, but then we came back and for uh, I went elk hunting in Utah, and uh, man, it was nasty weather when we were there, and it was uh, some snow and and you don't think about it, but even if it rains overnight or rains that morning or afternoon or whatever oh, yeah. even if it's not constant rain yeah. rain pants rain pants are so huge rain pants and gaiters yeah because you just you wear them when you're busting brush or doing whatever and uh a lot of times most most of the mornings in utah we had to wear them because it was that buck brush or you know waist high brush and busting yeah. through it you, you needed them or you're just going to be soaked and then your pants get soaked and they get into your socks and they get into your boots and then even if you take a couple hours midday to take a break or whatever your boots are still soaked for the afternoon so it's like you have to just stay dry that's one irritating thing about most rain gear is the fact that they they're always like cinch cinch straps and when you have to wear them like regular yeah. pants i really like belt loops you know something to yeah. put on you know that's one thing i like about the sick stuff where the belt sewed into it you never have to worry about bringing a yeah. belt you never have to think about that I, I do like that feature there's it's like anything there's good good and bad stuff about everything you'd like to tweak here and there but uh yeah yeah i pretty much ran like the dew point system which is their lightest their so lightest use... system yeah yeah you know that's good stuff, man. That's no doubt. I've got, I've got, I'm, I'm like, I'm not loyal to anybody. I got a little bit of, <laughs> a little bit of that. <laughs> yeah. Which is good. I mean, it's all at the end of the day, um, all high quality gear is, is going to do the job. Um, hmm. you know, I've ran, I've ran sick of stuff for, 
Um, I ran sick of stuff before I started working with them and I bought a lot of it because I was just like, you know, it's Gore-Tex, um, which is like probably, probably the one, you know, leading industry for when it comes to wind stopper and, and, right. and just waterproof. I mean, everyone uses Gore-Tex on some level and it's at sick disposal. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's just, you can't skimp on it. Like you can skimp on whitetail stuff. You can skimp on even right. some elk stuff, but as soon as you start dealing with cold and rain and boots, like you just can't. Yeah. Really boots can't. are, if I, if I was ever going to take something extra, it'd be boots. It seems like in Alaska. Yeah. So yeah. When we did so difficult to keep boots dry, but you know, when you're up yeah. sheep hunting and goat hunting, you just got to deal with it, you know? You gotta I deal a, with it. Yeah. I had a pair of caribou hunt last year. I paid buku dollars for custom made because I have giant feet, you know. Mm. I wear a 16 hunting so they don't blow. Do them. you really? Yeah. Jeez. So I literally could not feel the front of my feet for probably two to three weeks after that hunt. Really? Oh, it destroyed my feet. I couldn't believe it. I was just I was pissed off, really. Yeah. You know, and there's only one or two companies that build a boot that fit me now. So I'm back on my Kenetrex. So they, they're pretty good, solid boots. Yeah, so. I've had I've had two pair of Kenetrex. Kenetrex are great. I did uh, crispy, uh, like Brickstall Mountain Extremes. Uh, you got a lot of options in your size, though. Yeah, yeah. I don't have a size 16 foot. <laughs> I have to shop at bigfeet.com, you know. <laughs> I finally That's found a funny. I found a pair of you know when I lived in Alaska we used to hunt with Koflax mountaineering boots. Um, okay. They're a plastic boot. A lot of the sheep guys wear them, and okay. uh, so the beauty of them is when you're doing those real steep side hills or real steep vertical stuff in the rocks, and when you get a toe hold, it's like you're walking on a platform. Okay, it's mm. just I can't tell you. It seems so counter intuitive but they're so efficient when it comes to climbing and i i just found a pair on ebay two what year and a half ago they were the la sportiva olympic mons like they climb everest with okay in a, in a size 16 they're, those are like you don't know what i found those things are impossible <laughs> and it's crazy the quality of the gear because that pair of boots are gigantic you know yeah and they only weigh like 38 ounces for the pair really yeah, they're stupid light. So I'm kind of waiting That's... to use in the, this late season hunt up on the front here. Okay. Yeah. But I don't know That's if there's like, a uh, line. <laughs> that yeah, I've heard about that. You guys in Utah have absolutely got pounded uh last winter, right? Yeah, we got murdered. Our deer herd and elk herd in some areas just got decimated. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 one thing we don't really have to worry about too much out here. It's just those hard winters like you guys got to deal with. So what? Where do you? How do you do most of your whitetail hunting? You are you pretty much? Where do you live at anyway? Uh, Iowa. Oh, right outside, everybody, right outside Des Moines. Why is everybody that wants to be a kick butt hunter move to Iowa? <laughs> well, my situation wasn't a hundred percent. It was definitely a factor to move here because of hunting. But uh, my girlfriend Caitlin, she lived in Kansas City, and I lived in Michigan. Yeah. And she didn't want to move to Michigan and I didn't want to move or it's not that I didn't want to move to Kansas city. I just said, if I'm going to move, I'm going to move to Iowa. So Iowa is kind of our meet in the middle state, but yeah, everyone, move, everyone moves to Iowa um, because the regulations are very good for deer hunting. It's very hard for out of state hunters to get tags. Um, it's like a, just a cup. It would be like a coveted elk tag to come here. It's the hardest it's the hardest deer tag to draw. You need four or five or now six points. So, you know, five or six years to put in for it. Um, so there's very little out of state pressure. Um, they also have like landowner tags. So if you own land, you get an extra buck tag. So if you're like a bow hunter guy and you own land, you could kill three bucks a year with your bow, which is the most out of any state. I think you can only kill unless you get like some special draw tags or something. Um, but typically it's two tags. So that's where a lot, I mean, there's a lot of transplants here and I was just yeah, actually talking about that with someone. Yeah, um, Jeff, Jeff Hopkins moved there and 
I think actually a guy I had on a podcast yesterday from uh, um, uh, Raised Hunting. Oh, uh, yeah. Warren? Yeah, Warren, their family moved there, too, from Montana, I guess. He's there originally from Montana, so. Yep. Yeah, I like, just been... man, the, of all the white tail hunting I've done, I like Montana. <laughs> <laughs> Montana is unique. It's uh, it's honestly uh, underrated, and I think a lot of Western guys they just don't care about white tails. You know, right. They care about mule deer and elk and everything. So, I mean, all those river bottoms and stuff. I mean, it's really it's, it's actually quite huge. It's fun hunting. It's it really is early season, especially. I go up there and hunt with my friend. Yasty Perkins killer. And he's oh, always, nice. He's always killing big stuff up there. Yeah, he does kill a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, underrated. Underrated in Montana for sure. Um, but kind of so Iowa you, is just the Mecca. Do you hunt a lot of different states for whitetail or you just primarily stick yeah. to? Yeah, so I'll bounce around a little bit. Um, we got some property uh, in Ohio and then some property down in Oklahoma. So nice. those are kind of... Yeah. Always baffles me how you guys keep keep up with all these properties. One of the guys in our customer service, Jeff, you know, uh he every year kills a giant. I mean, two years yeah. ago killed a hundred and ninety inch buck. When oh, he, wow. he stuck it and lost it, hit a little bit high, come back in yeah. two weeks later, and he killed it and it had broken six inches off and it scored 184. It was a hell of a buck. I mean, it was it where was, at he lit well, he works in Kansas City, but I know his family's got okay. He, he him and a friend, they they put cameras up on like 12 or 15 different properties. It just seems oh, yeah. like man, that seems like a lot of work. It is a lot of work. I mean, it's a whole nother it's a whole nother game to western hunting or big game hunting because I mean, there's so much scouting that can be involved in Western hunting and everything. And there, I mean, obviously there's a lot of scouting for deer. It's just different. Like there's just different preparation all summer long. And yeah, I never I scout. Mean, <laughs> you just go out and go. <laughs> I, I, I do. To me, that's the fun, one of the fun of it, you know, and number one, I don't have a lot of yeah. time to scout, but number two, yeah. it's just like, sometimes I just like not knowing, you know, yeah. being surprised, you know. That's the fun yeah. of like going caribou hunting in Alaska. You just, you pop over the next ridge and you just don't know what's there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. You're, you're, you're spot on with that. It's just different. You know, there's different levels to it. There's different ways to do it. And some people love some stuff and hate other things. And I know all the Western guys don't love sitting in tree stands cause you can't move. You can't do anything. And dude, that's like <laughs> stab me in the throat type of thing. Is it Sitting in a tree stand, yeah. I'm I'm fidgety as it is, and I was in Kansas last year. I was telling Warren, and I'm sitting up in this freaking tree saddle in a scribbly tree, and I'm just thinking, if I move in the slightest, I'm busted. And sure <laughs> enough, this doe with two fawns come in. I got busted so fast. I'm like, this is a freaking waste of time. I can't move. I look like Sasquatch sitting up here. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. get, you know, so I don't know. I got off of it. That was a little bit of a frustrating hunt, but the yeah. part that uh that I really enjoy about whitetails compared to everything else is you can have history on properties mm -hmm. of deer and you can really um you can put a lot of effort in and then you can instantly see that effort pay off. So it's right. like this year, you know, we, we got a couple new properties that we're helping out on or whatever and put in a bunch of food plots, like hung a bunch of stands and manipulated a bunch of stuff pretty much. And it's like instantly, it's like you see the changes, you see the deer, you know, change and react to the habitat that you made for them. And that's super rewarding. It's, it's very, uh, it's no different than like planting a garden in your backyard and right. you get to watch it grow and, you know, you, you harvest it or whatever. It's very, very similar feeling, uh, which is very different than Western and, and big game stuff where you're just yeah, going it, out for the experience yeah, um, and everything. Yeah. Out here, it's just, it's mostly public land, you know, and it's, it's yeah. getting to the point where it's just, the problem is getting a tag, you know, yeah. that becomes the biggest struggle. And we had that conversation with Warren, you know, about how to keep young people into the sport and how hard it is to just go out and hunt as a family anymore. And, and yeah. things like that, it becomes, you know, you tend to, you know, go out and hunt for a, the family member that drew, you know, 
is what it ends yep. up. Yep. So, yeah. I guess that's it's a double edged sword. Yeah. Places like Texas and Africa and stuff like that. I guess it's just it's so expensive for most people, you know. It just money, yeah. man. There's so many it's, it's gotten to be such a big money game, you know. Yeah, hunting is very quickly becoming a rich man's sport, especially if you want to do uh big hunts or, or very unique hunts or good hunts. Yeah. Um and then it's also, I mean, it's just a such a double edged sword you have, you know, and I'm guilty of it. And it's, it's honestly a struggle at times, but it's, you're promoting hunting, you're promoting all these things and you're getting so many people into hunting and keeping people right. around that it's actually pressuring areas and driving other people out that have been hunting there forever. Yeah. Um, I was on a podcast like a month ago and we were talking about it. It's like here in Iowa. Yeah. Idaho, any, any state, you know, but for example, here in Iowa, um, let's say I come in and I lease out a property for the first time. Um, and now it's, you know, my exclusive hunting rights. But before that, let's say some 16 year old kid had permission to hunt there right? or a family or whatever. I mean, it's like, it just, it, it's such a double-edged sword of all these guys, you know, that are getting into it and, and splitting up pieces, buying property, selling property. It's great because we're growing the sport, but at the same time, there's all these repercussions about it that no one really thinks about, I think, until recently in these last couple of years. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, it's it's such a weird, such a weird topic. I had a friend in uh, that I was in the Army with. He was from Texas, and he just – the, the idea of public land to them is just non-existent. You know, if you don't have a oh, lease, you yeah. hunt, you know, and, yeah. and so that's kind of where it seems to be beheaded. So I don't know. Yeah. I'm getting to the age where I want to do cool adventure hunts. You know, I, one of my guys sent me a picture or a video of, you know, hunting red or uh fallow deer in the rut in Bulgaria. I was like, man, oh. that looked like, unbelievable i just it looked crazy unbelievable oh. i have a couple of staff shooters down in in australia too that they go out and hunt these fallow deer of course it's always the wrong time of year when i'm in tournament season of course but uh, my right. wife my wife's from argentina so when you get the stag roar it's you know oh maybe, yeah you know march april it's just so hard to get away i looked at the schedule it's like all the archery organizations are starting to talk to each other and so now there's like hardly any overlapping tournaments anymore so you're just gone all the time so Every we're going to keep moving yeah. moving on here um second question i had for you is like, how do you think that preparing for, or i mean has your your competitive shooting career helped you become a better bow hunter um and i i mean it's yeah. be unequivocally yes for 99 percent of people i just like to use that topic to kind of encourage people to get out and compete because they're going to learn more. You see a lot of people, you go to local bow shoots, they have terrible form. Um, mm -hmm. pro, you know, whether you have a good pro shop in your area or not, that can get you set up properly, whether you even take the time to learn. It's funny how much money people spend on a hunt and won't spend two nickels on learning how to shoot a bow. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it from a very young age, I mean, I started shooting competitions. Um, when I was 10. Yeah. Did um, you go through George Riles program? No. Yeah. So I, uh, I met George like later on. So I oh. was already, I was already established, um, shooting tournaments and everything. And then I think I was like probably 16 or 17 traveling around like the USAT circuit is when I just kind of got linked up with them. Um, but originally I was just, uh, like shooting in the backyard with my dad. Um, and he found a local, a uh, youth program called Livingston Conservation Sports Association. They had a really small Joe ad program. So I was six when he put me in that. So from six to 10, I shot like every Saturday for like two months in the winter time. I go and shoot like borrowing the bow off the rack sort of deal. Right. Um, and then finally, like my eighth birthday, I got a bow. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was 10, you know, we shot a first state local tournament. Um, and then kind of from there, we kept shooting state stuff and kept working up. But yeah, I think those gradual steps um, leading into that, I mean, I was always, my dad was a bow hunter. We got into archery because of bow hunting, but because we found tournament archery, yeah, I'm a way better 
archer and I learn so much more. I think the biggest thing is because shooting tournament archery and wanting to do good forces you to shoot more arrows and shoot year round, which I think just shooting your bow in general is the, the best thing you can do. Even if you have terrible form, you at least will be able to know what it feels like and be able to yeah. repeat it over and over again. Yeah, It's more natural instead of forced, you know? Yeah. And then I think, um, you know, just shooting tournaments and expanding the network of people like just like you, Tim, I mean, some conversations we've had and stuff I've heard from you. It's like all these things about tuning and form and, and what to do here and what to do there. I mean, you just learn so much and you get to talk to people about and, and talk to people that have shot a lot and have shot forever. And it's not just some backyard bow hunter thinking maybe it's like this because of that or this because of whatever. I mean, I I've learned most of my stuff from George just because we've had so many, you know, pro shop conversations late at night and tinkering on things or whatever over the years. I mean, I've learned a lot, a lot from George. Um, so yeah, I think one, you know, one is just, it's made me shoot good and learn good form. Um, but then also like the, the connections and the, the learning and understanding how bows work, understanding how, you know, things just work because right. at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's pretty black and white how things work at times and there's not witchcraft like everyone thinks there is or whatever. And it's, it's yeah, uh, it's, you know, I think what tournament archery does is if you're competitive, you can't really teach competitiveness people. If they're not competitive, they're not competitive. They're not willing to do, yeah. they don't really care enough to do what it takes to win. Um, then they're probably don't have the personality to persevere through that. But um, I think what, you know, for me personally, what is, what has taught me more than anything is that I just wanted to get better. I wanted to win. There was that incentive mm -hmm. out there to make me try to figure out what was wrong. And some of it was my draw length. I experienced more problems than, than I think other people would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More tuning issues, more sight leveling issues, more uh, things like that, just because of the length of my draw length. But I also have that innate nature. I mean, I see the same thing happening. I always joke around that we're the industry's, dumb down to the 30 yard whitetail bow hunter. And a lot of the products and stuff are just yeah. good enough for that instead of, and I think a lot of bow hunters kind of sell themselves short or a lot of times the dealers sell the bow hunters short by not introducing them to, you know, say five pin movable sites or, you know, teaching them how to properly level a site or, or a, a quality, you know, different types of, you know, arrow rests and things like that, that actually make, you know, things easier and a lot. And some of it is just the fact that, that people won't pay for the pro shops time. And yeah. so the pro shop kind of has to run people through because that's, they got to stay profitable, you know? Mm. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think even companies do that as a whole, you know, they call it's the Bubba bow hunter. It's the guy, you know, they just classify him in there and leave him in there. Um, which, you know, you're always going to have those guys. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, there's so much more out there and, and when it boils down to it, it's like, you need to be proficient at what you're doing for respect to like the animal respect to the sport, respect to everything. If you're, if you're going out there and it's like, can barely hit a pie plate at 20, you know, you probably shouldn't go hunting sort of thing, you know, right. but there's also, there's tons of guys like that. Sure. Yep. And, and, you know, you just think to yourself, you know, what if I could, what if I could shoot, you know, you hear these people all the time. They're like, well, I can't shoot as good as you. Well, maybe you should start doing some of the things I do. And yeah. Well, um, yeah, it's not, did you try? Yeah. I mean, it's not rocket science. I could take a guy here in a day or so and have him hitting at 70 yards, you know, it's like, yeah, it's just, but it's just basic fundamentals. And I, I, it's funny. I see the same thing. I just got back from an air rifle tournament yesterday and it's the same thing. It's exactly mm. the same thing in their industry is if you want the top level information, you got to get it from the top level competitors. You know? Yeah. Well, you it's know, just I, the people that put, it's the people that put the most time in to the craft. I think yeah. it's just, I mean, a lot of bow hunters, I mean, they're not shooting year round all the time you know there is an off season for for bow yeah. hunting and bow hunters there just is yeah yeah you know i i'd recommend guys get at least three months ahead of bow season but it depends how proficient you are if you spent your whole life competing you know like i have it's not that hard to get a bow together 
and be really accurate for hunting. I mean, I it's yeah. not not that difficult. I mean, there are things to consider that people don't consider that have less technical expertise. And I'll give you an example of this, even myself, you know, I, I'm very aware of air density and how it affects aeroflight and, you know, your, your pin gaps and your, your sight tapes and stuff like that. But, you know, sometimes I just take a little bit for granted and just go with it. I was up in elk camp this year. We I live at 4,500 feet, and we were at 9,500 feet. And I try to just bang this out. Because if you're going to plan a trip to Kodiak Island to hunt deer, or you're going down, you know, to go mountain goat hunting, you know, you know who Pedro Ampero is? Yeah. Yeah, Pedro called me. He has on like an Argali or one of them big Marco Polo sheep hunts. And he, he uh, had missed a sheep and just, you know, kind of go through the scenario of what went wrong. Well, I could, t- I come up with two or three things, you know, he didn't have a target in camp where he was allowed to, to really sight his stuff in the way he needed to, you know, when you're going up in those high elevations, when I went to elk camp this year, I live at 4,500 feet, elk camp was 9,000, 9,500. I was literally 10 inches to 12 inches high at a hundred yards. You know, that was two foot a second different. On the really? Site. Oh yeah. When I go to Reading every year, I'm two foot a second difference on a site tape from Utah to California. So if I go low level Utah to high level Utah where the air is thinner or Denver or wherever else, you know, you got to have a way to check your sight tapes. You got to take sight tapes with you and you got to recite your stuff in when you get there. That's one of the high recommendations that I give people because you cannot assume anything. Never assume, especially if you're coming from back east out west, that your stuff's going to hit the same. Come prepared. I mean, I use, uh, there's a guy, new guy out. It's called Precision Cut Archery. Have you heard of his program? No, I haven't. So Precision Cut Archery is a new guy that's come out with a shite tape program that has, I think his cuts are spot on. I mean, I've got a little mm. bit more to proof it out, but it is just a very cool program um, that allows you to do a lot of different things. And and that's one thing I'd recommend to bow hunters. If you're running, don't rely on a shop to print you a sight tape. It is not that difficult. It costs 20 bucks a year or something like that to to have this you know program to print sight tapes and learn how to manipulate them. Yeah. So when I go on a hunt, I take a sheet of sight tapes with me and I'm prepared to 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 shoot. I mean, I went in a caribou hunt, I took a I took a target to camp. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I uh I, I do the same thing. I mean, just you don't know travel, you know, third axis yeah. gets bumped or whatever, it can change anything. And actually when I when I went up to my mountain goat hunt, they did not have a target in camp. So I was like, okay. And and when we got to like base base camp back at like the lodge, we had like an hour before we were getting on the plane. So I just didn't have time to do anything. So we hiked all the way in and we spike camped. And I'm like, man, I really want to shoot my bow like just to, for my own self-confidence or whatever. So I found this little tundra spot and I checked it for rocks or whatever. And I stepped back to 40 and I just shot one and I, I hit right where I was aiming. So I was like, okay, I'm at least, you know, 20, 40 yards. And, and, that, and that's you know, beyond that, I didn't know. That's frustrating to me that outfitters and guys don't think about, especially bow hunting outfitter guys, they don't think about that because yeah, there's nothing worse than, missing an animal because you didn't you want to prepare but you don't have any way to prepare you know i yeah and you're not going to be able to go on a hunt for hard for seven eight days in the mountains and not fall once or twice and wonder if you just jack something up yeah one of the reasons Mm -hmm. i shoot the rest yeah 100 yeah one of the reasons i shoot the rest setup i do the site setups i do i want to be able to that's got to take some abuse, you know, it really does. I mean, I'll go, I'll go and serve my bowstrings a little bit more than I would for everything else just to protect them because they get, the right. feet. I fell on mine this year, elk hunting and cut two strands, you know, and it's just like, oh, really? yeah, I was on an elk hunt one year and I fell on the yoke and cut all but four strands of my yoke. And I'm, we got a 350 bull coming into a wallow. And I mean, we got him. He's, I know where he's headed. Ugh. And and I just watched the marks on my cams just start to creep, and I'm like, I can't draw that bow back. I'm done. Oh gosh, that that sucks. And I was done, man. And it just so it just you got to be prepared as much as you can. Yeah. 
you know, you're going to Alaska. I would, you know, carry a, what you call it, a cinnamon bow press. You're familiar with that? Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's actually made in Argentina. And this guy made a little rope press. It's called a cinnamon press. You can get them through Lancaster archery. Um, it's a great portable bow press for you guys. If you're going on backcountry hunts, uh, you know, allows you to, to at least work on your stuff. If you do have a spare string, you can get something back in semblance of order. So, um, yeah, when I went, when I went to Alaska and to BC, I just had a, a little pouch of, I had an extra set of strings and, uh, for Matthews, they have that cable where you can press the, press the bow with just that cable. So right. if we needed to swap anything, we could do that at an extra rest, just like a, 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 a smaller like qed rest not the bolt-on one or it was just the bolt-on one just in case i'm serving some glue you know just like sure. if something bad happened we could maybe put it back together yeah and if you're a guy that relies on a bow shop to do all your work i mean you're just gonna feel like somebody just destroyed your hunt you know and you, but where, yeah where I, had, I i had you know on my caribou hunt i kind of made a mistake where i cut my arrow up Cause I'm always like, my arrows are always weak, you know, and I'm, I cut them really yeah. tight to the rest. And I ended up putting a biter knock on just to give me a little more length. And I, I just told myself last minute, you should have bent the launcher up a little bit, get a little more room. And I get on hard on this caribou and I, I shoot him at 66 yards and I liver shot him. And I thought, God, I, I, and then I could not hit him with a second shot. I was just like, Oh, what? really? I'm like, what the heck is going on here? It turns out, long story short, I was drawing the arrow up on the broadhead. Oh. So yeah. I had, I didn't freak out about it. I put the target up. I had come prepared. I used the thorn broadhead, so they have a really good practice system on it. And mm. I ended up, it took me a while to get that thing dialed back in because the target wasn't stopping arrows all that well. And trying to dig them out of the tundra, man, it's crazy how far they go up under. That, that yeah, that is not, that is not a good program. I've done that. No, no. I was panicking. Finally, I dug deep enough where I found four of them. And I'm like, oh. but it was just <laughs> stupid stuff. But, you know, the more knowledge you have, the less you panic in situations like that. Oh, yeah. You, know, you understand that, hey, even if I bend the rest up, now all I really have to do is lower the rest until my impact point's the same at 50. And then my tune should be the same. So right, if right. you're not fluent with bows, that becomes much harder to do. So. I mean, that's, that's, well, that's why it's good to like another reason to get in the competition and everything. Cause it forces you, I, I guess some people don't, but it forces you to work on your equipment more because you're always tinker and you're always doing stuff. And, uh, I for sure wouldn't have learned stuff that I know if it wasn't for that and talking to guys and, and forcing myself to work on bows, you know, yeah. I'd be the pro shop, I'd be the pro shop guy where it's like, Hey, got a new bow, like bring it in. I mean, it's there's so, of, so many, so many big bow hunters still do that. I mean, most of them do. It's crazy. It, it really is. And I, I really have aspirations of building a website and YouTube channel that, you know, is, is basically, I want to call it, I can archery. I want to teach people. I want them to understand that it's not that difficult and give them a roadmap from A to Z on how to do this stuff. Cause it can be intimidating, I guess. So. Mm-hmm. Hundred well, percent, and I, I think I think that's the, that's the tough thing. Real quick before we move on, that's the tough thing, but I think it's evolving uh, because of you know what you're doing, just like with this podcast and everyone else is doing with media. That people are slowly building home bow shops. You know, I think I heard from someone that like bow press sales are at like an all time high because yeah. they're selling to all these home basement pro shops that everyone's building out so that's it's really cool to see i mean it's definitely on the in the right direction yeah, and even even you know there's just so many little things that we take for granted you know when i'm building a bow i got 127 different options on how to fix a problem and you know and and, and sometimes yeah. you just gotta you gotta delve into that but we just got a few more minutes here and yeah. i just kind of wanted to it's probably a question a, a lot of people have you know when when so Chris B, you got a massive following on on YouTube and, and on Instagram. And so when you went into yeah. like say you wanted to get into the outdoor industry, was it a concerted effort or was it kind of an accident? Or did you did you have a really good plan that you just executed? Um 
it was very natural. Um, it was not uh, until it started going, it was no sort of, you know, well executed plan or anything. Um, like I said, I, you know, started shooting competitions when I was like 10 years old, um, started shooting more state tournaments, stuff like that. And then when I was like 14, 15, we started traveling a little bit more to some of the USA shoots and stuff. So, um, was getting better, made some of those youth teams and stuff at that same time. I think I was 15 or 16. I started shooting NASP, which was national archery in the schools program. Mm -hmm. Um, traveled all around. I actually did very well there. We did a couple international trips, um, like traveling on like their world team essentially. Um, and through that, through my competition, we just met, you know, I met people, you know, met the Hoyt guys, met you just met all, you know, these industry guys that still overlap in a bow hunting thing. So that's kind of where I, I got connections. But as far as like videos, I just enjoyed, uh, from a young age, like filming my hunts just for fun. Uh -huh. So I, I went, I went like a long stint. I think I was 15, 15 until I think it was two years ago. Every single animal I killed with the bow was on film. Oh, it was right. like 50 some animals. Yeah. It was like 50 oh. some animals. I did a ton of solo filming, but I just enjoyed it. You know, when I was 15, 16, 17, 18, all through high school, I just enjoyed filming. Um, and we made funny videos and you know, you doing whatever and I posted them. You doing all the editing. Yeah. That yep, to me. So all editing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, that's kind of the Achilles heel, you know, it's like, oh. <laughs> well, you, you can, you can, you can get an intern to do that stuff now. You yeah. can. Um, but yeah, I just really enjoyed it. You know, I, I enjoyed the creative outlet, um, that it was, and I very much enjoyed, um, just filming hunts and whatever. So, it wasn't until my second year in college, my sophomore year in college, where I was like, okay, you know, I maybe had 10,000 subscribers or something, um, maybe 20, some, super low. And uh, I was like, you know what, I'm going to dedicate one fall to filming all my hunts, making it something, and we'll just see where it goes, you know. And like, no, no, it was all my own money. It was, you know, I, I, I bought all my own camera stuff, all that jazz. So we dedicated, I actually dropped out of my college classes on the very last day I would get a full refund. It was like, I think it was like October. It was the first week of October. And I think I was actually on the hunting trips and I dropped out because I was like, I'm going to fail all these classes. I gotta, I gotta drop before I get, I get dinged for all the money. And, uh, I just dedicated a whole fall. Like I just went around and I filmed everything and, uh, you know, refined my editing and we posted it. And I mean, it did, it did good at the time and it did good enough to where I was like, okay, maybe this could actually be something. Um, and from that day on, we just kind of rolled with it. Um, and as it progressed, I mean, I self filmed and buddies filmed for several, several, several years until, you know, it finally reached a point where it's a full on business. I mean, now we have, you know, several employees and we got a warehouse and wow. we're traveling all around and we're doing whatever. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a full blown thing, but it all started just from, you know, a tiny little YouTube channel, self filming. So, and, so, where, and so where does the monetization come from? Do you get paid from YouTube and, and Instagram or do you like sell products or do you, do you, yeah. uh, little about little everything i probably yeah. little it, it's a little bit of everything yeah um but as far as youtube goes i mean there's youtube channels any youtube channel not just my hunting one or whatever uh you set up for uh monetization so adsense revenue so you allow google to advertise on your channel and then you just get a cut from that so the more views you get the more money you make that's just it's very cut and dry but that's wow. that's that's very industry uh, YouTube love. I mean, anyone, anyone can do that of regardless sure. of what they do. Um, and then, yeah, my, uh, like B roll merch. So I started that I think It's been like four years now we've expanded it into like hard, good products and, and whatever else. So we have our, our e-commerce and we got a warehouse here in Iowa that we ship everything out of. Um, so that's definitely grown. And then, you know, working with companies and 
and working with companies has definitely evolved into uh, more like back end things. Like obviously working with Ultraview, we've been I've been with them since the start and Colby and right, you know, work with them on very much like day to day stuff. Um, and and Matthews and all all these other companies it. it And that's where a little bit of like competition background and been around since, you know, I was a young teenager um, has really helped because we've seen it and, and, and now it's target and archery and kind of getting into more back end stuff, you know? Interesting. I I think it was George or somebody that mentioned to me one time about how many Matthews grips you sold. And I was like, Holy crap. It's uh it's quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty insane. I yeah, I, I I started selling some three D printed grips for Botex and different bows, and I, I mean, I yeah. just kind of I I I don't get real serious about it, you know. But I mainly yeah. I, initially I wanted it for myself, you know. Hundred percent. Yeah, uh, I ran into a guy over in France that does a pretty good job three D printing and and uh, a little side cash, you know, pay for all my. Oh ride. yeah, yeah. No, hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, there's. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think it's great. And I always say, you know, cause obviously I work really tight with Matthews and, and we make a custom grip for the bows that right. I shoot for or whatever. And so yeah, that's gotta like, be a pretty good gig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're always like, ah, like you're shooting. They're fine. I mean, they're awesome. Um, but it's amazing. Some people love the stock grip and some people hate my grip and some people, you know, vice versa, but they right. land on something, you know, which it's, is it's great. Funny. It's funny. It's very individual yeah yeah but it's great it's great that you're making grips too i mean everyone everyone has their own unique feel it's the only part of the bow you're actually touching it should have the most customizability in my opinion because everyone's a little bit different Uh, of course there's there's bad options but uh yeah it's it's there's no problem i think i think there should be tons of customizability for them yeah i like the way you have a big flat surface on there i did it i did a test years ago where we put a bathy's lx in a shooting machine and i was doing a video just to showcase the accuracy and you know basically looking at the memory issues of some carbon arrows and so mm-hmm. initially when i shoot a shooting machine i shoot three arrows in the same hole before i start because that's your baseline you have to have that before you can prove anything right okay. and i put this one arrow in three times and i shot a i shot a group 10 inches wide with one arrow and i was like what the hell? And the only thing I come up with is that, you know, that, that old rounded Matthews grip, that wood one yeah, was yeah. causing the problem. So I took it off, put a sh- flat shrewd grip on there and retuned it. And it was like night and day. They just went all like, inside out in a dime. And really? Oh yeah. I, I, I just, I preach that to guys all the time. I mean, I, I run a usually a fairly nice flat grip because it controls the load transfer. When the cable guards yep. unload, you have to slow that motion down and a flat grip does it best. So, yeah. And I don't think a lot of, you know, new guys getting in the sport, they grab a bow, they shoot it. They, they don't have any idea what to look for. It just feels good or it feels better than yep. what they have. So, but, and I'm, I mean, I feel like that's why a lot of people, you know, there's certain products that, I mean, this goes outside of archery. When you use them, it just seems better or something's different. Like you don't maybe even intentionally go in it with good positive attitude, but you shoot it or you try. It's like, man, something, I just like feel like my groups are a little bit tighter. Or it feels a little bit different. And I mean, a grip, a good grip is definitely that. Like you don't really, you don't understand why. Yeah. Um but it just does, you know. You know, I I I prove it to people a lot, and the way I do that is through paper. And I, I tell yeah. you, I use that saying all the time: paper tells no lies. You know. Yeah. I'm out here trying to shoot my hunting bow, and I wanted to shoot a hook style jaw so bad. I got a couple Arc Systems release out of France. I saw that. Yeah, I saw that the other day you posted. I'll be da- I cannot get consistency even through paper. I just it makes my paper tuning even more. Uh, uh, crazy so let's just go ahead and just leave it at that um i appreciate you coming on i appreciate everything you do for the industry um wish you a best of luck for the rest of the year i encourage our our viewers to you know delve into archery you know go to gold tips youtube channel facebook page you know watch some of the videos watch some of the videos chris puts out watch you know educate yourself any way possible there's a lot of resources out there and it'll make you a better, you know, archer and bow hunter. 
So with thanks, that, Tim. I appreciate you. We'll check out. Have a good one. Thank you. Hey, before you go, there's a great way to get even more info and tips. Follow this podcast and check out Gold Tip on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. And as always, start tough and stay true.